Welcome back. Good to see everyone. Good evening to, to you all. I hope as you come in tonight, you've received a card or you got a card, fill it out, put your name on it, and we'll have a drawing here just a, shortly after the meeting tonight. We'll have a drawing to see who wins the literature up here on the rack. You can get to pick whatever you like. I hope everyone's had a, a good couple of days off and we'll get back into it tonight and tomorrow night and then we'll skip a night and hit it a couple more nights. So uh, uh, everybody enjoying the meetings? Amen. Well, I am. I, I like the way the pastors are doing that. But uh, we don't have no special music at this time and for everyone that's uh, watching online and those here, well, we're going to go right on into the service. So, Pastor, if you want to lead us, we'll go right on. Testing. Thank you, Tim. Good job. We, uh, it's been a it's been a joy being here with you. This is uh, tonight. Looking at the trumpets, it's one of the most confused and difficult passages to interpret. And so, I hope that we can make good sense of it tonight as we open up the scriptures and look at the usages from uh, some of the expressions as they uh, allude back to. Uh, scriptures in the Old Testament and some of earlier texts in the New Testament. Let's have prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, thank you again for Jesus, for the promise that you'll be here with us. Thank you for the revelation of Jesus to help us get a better picture of you, some of the things that you are doing for us now. Lord, we just we pray for all of the ones that are coming, the ones that are here, we just thank you that we can be together. Pray for those who are listening online that it will, uh, everything will work well. Lord, we have a, a sick baby we want to lift up, and you know all the other needs. So, Father, we just give it all to you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the hope we have. Give us a clear understanding tonight in your name. Amen. The trumpets, what are they, what are they all about? When I was at seminary, uh, John Pauline was my teacher, and they had a class, or he offered a class, called Advanced Revelation. Now, that's a class that you would have expected everybody to want to go to, right? It was an elective, and this was done by John Pauline. Now, John Pauline had his dissertation on the seven trumpets. A lot of the material I'm sharing with you tonight uh, is a lot of stuff I've learned from him. But as we've studied it out and gone through scriptures and looked at it and gone again and again, uh, there's a lot of these uh, scriptures that just really enlighten and help you see better what's going on. I know when I took that class, I think there was probably five of us in there. And I wanted to be sure that I, I was there. I think I was the first one to get signed up. I was there early. I didn't know if it would fill up or not. But we were going to be going deep into the Greek. And this was not one of those easy A classes. And so I didn't know exactly what to expect. But one thing I did know is this is the revelation of Jesus. And I wanted to know a little bit more about Revelation than I knew going into it. Actually, I wanted to learn a whole lot more, and I think I did. One class, or one of my assignments in that class, was to do a 30-page paper on one verse from the trumpets. Now, my teacher had his dissertation in the trumpets, and that was a bit intimidating. So what I did is I chose the last verse in chapter 8. And uh, tonight we'll hit it just a little bit, and that will be introducing where we're going tomorrow night. But it was an introductory verse. I said, well, there's not a whole lot happening in that verse. Maybe I can get away with it. And it's in studying that one introductory verse that several of these themes that, I've been, that I learned from Revelation 
came from the study of that verse. In fact, I thought I'd come up with a lot of really uh, uh, new things, and for me, they were new. But in reading some of his materials, he had already had that published, and other people had already found it. There's nothing new under the sun. But as we begin to grasp this, I believe that God opens it to our minds and to our eyes that we can have a clearer uh, a devotional walk with our God. And so tonight, we're going into chapter 8 of Revelation. This is, again, one of the more hard to understand as you're reading it through what's going on. And I just pray that you can make sense of it. I'll be here to answer any questions afterward. Um, but we're ready to jump right in. Revelation chapter 8. Now, when you're looking at the trumpets and the usages of these trumpets, you find the Old and New Testament, they're a little bit different, but throughout the Old Testament, 53 times it was used in, in reference to worship, an additional 22 times in battle with the priest blowing it, which was really an act of worship, so you could really add the two together. Um, 33 times for marching orders, 10 times for warnings, 9 times for coronation, 4 times for theophanies. Now, the, theophany is when a person comes into uh, a uh, visit with God, where they're able to, an angel from God or God himself, a divine being, meets with a person. That's what, what a theophany is. And usually when you see this happen, especially in the New Testament, uh, most of the times you see it, of course, trumpets in Revelation 8 and 9, you know, mostly, but seven times when God met with somebody or when Jesus is coming, you see the use of the trumpet. And, you know, three times for ordinary use where they were blowing a trumpet. But what I wanted you to catch is there are several different usages for trumpets. And so when we're trying to figure out what these trumpets represent here in Revelation 8 and 9, keep in mind how they were used quite often in worship or in meeting with God. Um, Old Testament, it was really a symbol of covenant prayer. They were, when they would pray for deliverance, they would have the feast of trumpets or they would have uh, the trumpet blowing. It was... Uh, really an intercessory prayer asking God for deliverance, for his protection. In the New Testament, again, it was quite often in, re in reference to the actual voice of God or the appearing where God appeared to him. Numbers chapter 10, we have a background text that really kind of helps us understand what these trumpets are about. Again, I'm in an in introductory part here. I want you to be able to get a picture of this before we get into them. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am your uh, I am the Lord your God. Um several uses right here in this one section blow them as a warning blow these trumpets when you're going into battle but what was it for to remind them that there is a God to remind them that the battle is not mine but it is his and when I'm facing the enemy and the, and the battle is raging there is not a fear to be had but a recognition that there is a deliverance that comes from God above. And this is why he had the priest blowing the trumpets, the, the priest who would lead out in worship. And it was a reminder, again, even not just in the battle, but in the good times and in the happiness and their, 
uh, peace offerings and so forth. It was a memorial of the Lord their God. So again, trumpets, they're symbols of the prayers of the saints to make things right that have gone wrong in the world. I believe that's what the seven trumpets are all about. Remember the fifth seal. The souls under the altar crying out to God, How long, O Lord, just and true? How long do you avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? There were people who had taken their lives. And their blood was crying out like the blood of, uh, of Abel, crying out to God. There is a, a need for justice to be had here. How long till we see this? In the trumpets, we begin to get an answer to this. We begin to see God's vengeance upon those who have done wrong to his people and to himself. Notice uh, uh, the very first one. Okay, we're in Revelation 8 now. I saw these seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given the seven trumpets. This is a reference back to the chapter before. The seven angels, four angels holding back the seven angels now who had the seven trumpets. Here we go. I saw another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Again, we had been talking about this. The trumpets represented the intercessory prayer, where they're lifting up one another in prayer and praying to God, praying for God to bring deliverance, praying for God to protect them. Here, uh, the saints, the, the prayers of the saints are being offered up as the trumpets or the angels are about to sound here. And the smoke of incense. When you think of smoke, you get this picture, but the smoke of the incense, again, this is a sanctuary picture. You have the incense coming up from the altar, and it would go over into the Holy of Holies where God's presence was. And so the smoke of the incense now, uh, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Verse 5, the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. There were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Here's an indication here that while we have the introductory taking place in heaven and the prayers of the saints going before God himself, now it's being cast down to the earth. And we're going to be looking for actions that take place here upon the earth. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Here we go. First trumpet. First angel sounded. Hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and the third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. That's the first one. That's it. Nothing else said about it. So what do you make of that? Well, let's break it down. You've got the hail and fire. Often throughout the uh, scriptures, hail and fire are used by God as judgments. You see it in the, uh, in the plagues and elsewhere. Um, mingle with blood, they're thrown to the earth. A third of the trees were burned up. What do the trees represent? God's people. And all the green grass was burned up. Again, grass representing people. We'll see these. Uh, we'll be sharing some text here in just a moment with this. We have a picture here of this judgment, this trumpet, but yet it's all written in the language of God's people, the righteous. What's going on with this? It makes it very confusing at first glance. However... As we break this down, I think you're going to get a good picture of really what's taking place. Furthermore, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel says, saying, Son of man, set your face toward the south, preach against the south, and prophesy against the forest land, the south, and say to the forest of the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in you. It shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame 
uh, shall not be quenched. And all faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. And all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. What is he talking about here? Is he talking about a hill with trees growing up that's going to get burned? No, he's talking about people. Notice how he said um, uh, prophesy against the south and um, hear the word of the Lord. I will kindle fire in you, devour every green tree, and all the faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. It's the people that's in focus. The tree, Psalm 1, the, uh, the righteous man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And several other texts we can go into on that. He's talking here a prophecy coming to his people if they are not faithful to the covenant. If they are not faithful to God, this will be the result. It brings up again Deuteronomy 26 and 28 and, and the blessings and the curses. If you obey my word and you walk in my ways, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to give this to you and I'm going to give that and cause you to ride on the high places of the earth. But if you are unfaithful and he goes into the curses, we'll be looking at some of them in later trumpets tonight. Jesus, as he was on his way to the cross, was talking to a group, group of ladies, and they were weeping for him, and all they was going, and he says to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us. And to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Who's the green tree here? Come on. It's Jesus. Okay, he's referring to himself. If they do this to me... Imagine what they're going to do when I'm not here, what they're going to do to my followers, and so forth. John the Baptist and Jesus both begin with prophecies that are, are expre explaining that the time prophecies were being fulfilled, the time is at hand, and they're recognizing that the people of God had not been faithful and that things are about to take place. John says in Matthew 3, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Is he talking about trees here? No. He's talking about people that aren't faithful are not going to continue. They claim to be the people of God. They were born of Abraham, and they could trace their lineage back. They were born in Jerusalem or Bethlehem, or they, and they had their regions about them. But were they the people of God? Only those who were faithful. Those who did not bear the fruit were about to be uprooted. The time, the prophecy was that they had the 70-week prophecy. Remember, we covered this. It brought it to A.D. 34 for the Jewish people to be the people of God those who would be faithful to God would continue being his people the others would be cut off well Peter explains it he tells us the time for has come for judgment to begin at the house of God the judgment always begins at the house of God if it begins with us first what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God we're getting a picture here what's going on, are we not? Who is this trumpet uh, talking about? Who is it going to? It's going toward God's people, but it's going to God's people who were not faithful. First trumpet, I believe, is actually a uh, reference back to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. The first judgment the first trumpet it was in the house of God it was on his own people who had rejected 
him. When, they, when we reject Jesus, we no longer have the life-giving uh, uh, blood flowing through us. Rather, become the dry, the dry tree that, he's, that he was referring to here. All right, second trumpet. It's going to become even clearer as we get into these. The second angel sounded. Something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Well, this just sounds like a horror uh, movie, doesn't it? <laughs> what is happening here? You've got a third of this dying and a third of it being destroyed. You've got a, um, a great mountain burning with fire being thrown into the sea and a third of the sea becoming blood. And what in the world is happening here? Well, if you look at the background to this one, the, uh, the first plague in Exodus the plague of uh, when they Egypt, uh, the blood was the rivers were turned to blood, and all the water was turned to blood. This seems to be a clear reference uh, or a background text to what's going on here in chapter eight. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, "Take your rod, stretch your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water, that they may become blood." There shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did just so, or did so just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod, struck the waters that, that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river turned to blood. Egypt was a very dry country except right along the Nile River. The, all the life-giving uh, water that would flow through there, their nourishment came from the water. When they would go to the water, this is where they would, uh, would find life. And when, now when they go to the water, there was nothing there but blood. There was nothing that, that could uh, uh, give them, grow their crops, give them something to drink, to nourish their bodies, or anything like that. It had turned to blood. So, the result, the fish that were in the river died. The river stank. The Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Every source of life was dependent upon that Nile River running through there. Without that river, they did have life. And so this was very, uh, uh, well, it's emergency mode right now. We've got to get this taken care of. We can't just continue with this. And, and so you remember the story how Pharaoh would, would pretend to, uh, to be sorry and pretend to let his people go and so forth. They would turn it back and he would change his mind. It was time for another plague. But this plague right here is a background to the second trumpet what's taking place well God says I will repay Babylon the inhabitants of Chaldea for all the evil they have done in Zion in your sight says the Lord behold I am against you O destroying mountain who destroys all the earth says the Lord I will stretch out my hand against you roll you down from the rocks and make you a burnt mountain who is he talking to well, this is, uh, this is Babylon here. And um, who is Babylon? What is Babylon referring to? Throughout the Old Testament, and in fact, a few texts in the New Testament, including chapter 18, you find Rome as being a reference to Babylon. And, and so you have the judgment that's taking place here. And uh, it's upon Babylon but Babylon's already fallen. It's gone. Then you had Medo Persia. Then you had Greece. You had Rome. And Rome was during the time when Jesus was here. And so you know we're not talking about ancient Babylon at this point. And so in careful study, you begin to find out that Babylon's referring to Rome. It's that burnt mountain. And uh, you have the, um, uh, 
the suffering uh, that, that has come into this world at the hands of Rome, who was so evil and so forth, how they crushed everyone. And yet, we find this judgment is actually referring to the fall of Rome. And uh, the first trumpet was on the house of Israel. And you have the destruction of Jerusalem, which Rome did. Then God turns and punishes Rome and because they had enjoyed it too much and, and how far they had taken it. But notice, it's the two powers that united in killing Jesus that the first two trumpets are going to. You have Israel, those who had rejected Jesus, and you have Rome that has now rejected him completely and have turned their backs upon him, um, a uniting of religious and secular. Israel wanted nothing to do with Rome. They wanted to destroy them. They wanted to get them out of there. Rome couldn't stand the Jews. I mean, this was an ongoing battle of them as they're trying to rule over them. They had more trouble with the Jewish uh, uh, country than they did all the other ones put together. And so there was just all these uh, uprisings and, and so forth. And yet, when it came to killing Jesus, the two powers united together as you find them sending Jesus between Pilate and Herod and working together on the crucifixion of Jesus. Third trumpet. An a third angel sounded. Great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. It fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. What do we have in this trumpet? Again, there's not a whole lot to go on at first glance. You see the um, uh, great star named, named Wormwood that fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and a third of the men dying. That's it. What are you going to do with this one? How do you make sense of this? Well, let me give you a little hint. You have key words here. Many of you have concordances. If you don't, hopefully you win it and grab a concordance. Every place the word is used, you look it up. Wormwood. Where all is it used? About 11, 12 times in the Bible. And you look that up and, and see how it is used. You look at the star. What does the star represent? I have had uh, several tell me that there is an um, asteroid, a large asteroid up in space right now, and they've named it Wormwood. And they're expecting it to hurl toward the earth and the damage that it's going to do. And there are many people who are terrified about what's coming from that asteroid that they've named Wormwood. Now, is that what this is referring to? Or did they see something up there and they name it after this? You see, if that asteroid doesn't hit, then there's another asteroid up there. They'll name that one Wormwood. And so on and so forth until eventually they figure they've got it right. But what is the great mountain that strikes the earth and grows and fills the earth? That's the second coming of Christ. That's his kingdom, according to Daniel 2. But what is this one? What is this star? Well, in Revelation 1, what do we find the stars represented? It's the angels, right? The angels of the seven churches. He's holding the seven stars in his right hand. And the seven stars are the angels or the leaders of those churches, correct? Revelation 1. He sees this star uh, fall from heaven, burning like a torch. There's our two keys right there. Star falling from heaven, burning like a torch. Well, what does the torch represent? Well, let's go um, Isaiah 14. Here's our background text to this one. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. 
you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Do you want to be like God? Of course we do. But that's not what, I, what Satan was saying here. He wanted to be God. He wanted to rise above God, the created being, to rule over the creator. And you get this uh, picture here of what all is going on. We're going to see this a lot more in detail when we get to chapter 12. And we see uh, how Lucifer and the war that took place in heaven. But here I want you to catch. He was cast out of heaven. He was cast down to the earth. And this is a reference here, I believe, to a fallen angel. Because he's cast down. Um, what does the torch or the lamp represent? Well, Psalm 119, 105, it's the word of God, right? We'll see this again in a minute as well. Um, John 7. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom he, those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So what does this represent? Jesus says, I am the living water. He is promising water, the water that would bring life. He is promising nourishment. And, and yet here you see a picture in chapter 8 of a bitter water of water that becomes bitter and it makes the people it kills the people you know in fact I accidentally went forward I'm going to go ahead and read that one with you now too Exodus 15 you have the story of uh, Israel as they've gone out of Egypt and God's leading them to the promised land they've gone through the Red Sea they've, uh, they face the Egyptian army they have encountered one problem after another. And they are going through the wilderness, going through the desert, and they are thirsty. They reach a place called Mara. And when they came to Mara, they found water here. They could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Mara means bitter. And so they were expecting life giving nourishment they wanted to quench their thirst they wanted to be able to finally have something to drink and after all of this dust and the heat as they're as they're marching through they finally get to the water and they can't drink it it's going to bring death to them of course the solution god told moses cut down that tree cast it in the water and the waters became sweet. Do you know what that tree represented? That's the cross of Jesus. That's the tree upon which life came to this world. Life uh, to a world that was dying in sin. And, and so these waters that were promising everything that they were looking for brought nothing but bitterness and death. Jesus says, I am bringing you water. I, and he was referring to the Holy Spirit that hadn't yet come because it was with Christ. When Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit here. But what God says is, his word is good. His word is true. His word brings life. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And yet there is another fallen being who has been cast down, and he makes the waters bitter. What's going on? Well, 
Paul prophesies about it in 2 Timothy chapter two, uh, chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, saying, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince. Rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Paul prophesies that there is a time coming in which they're not going to want to hear the truth. They're not going to be turning to the word of God, the, the, the true word of God. They're not looking for sound doctrine. They want something that sounds good to them. They want something that fits their newspaper. They want something that they can have and that they can make money off of and they can sound good. And yet God says his word lasts forever. His word is truth all the way to the end. And Yet there are people who will heap up for themselves teachers who will be looking for something other than what God has given. What we're talking about here is a false doctrine. What we're talking about here is a counterfeit truth. Because while Jesus is the life and Jesus brings the, is the water of life, there is a counterfeit that comes in and, and, and brings death and destruction. The third trumpet is a reference to apostasy. You see the truth. The truth is there. But yet it's been distorted. It's been twisted up. This is a falling away from the truth or a, uh, something that brings a false sense of security, a false worship. You see... A loss of truth leads to a loss of a personal walk with Jesus. Because if we are in the Word of God, and we are studying the Word of God, and we are finding Jesus, and Jesus given to us from God, and God is leading us into His way everlasting, then what we're able to do is we're able to walk closer with Him. We're every step of the way. We're able to guard our minds, and we're able to... Uh, to guide our feet because his word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. He shows us the way to walk. And when we go to that water, we find life-giving, nurturing water that will bring life eternal. The devil brings in the counterfeit. You see, this brings us, this leads us right to the dark ages, right to the time in which they would take the Bible away from the people, and then they could teach them anything they want. And there were so many doctrines that crept into the church during this time period, uh, just after this, that would now lead people up to uh, believing anything they taught. They made a lot of money built a lot of wealthy places but they didn't lead people to Jesus this third trumpet sets the stage because when you distort the word of God when you take a doctrine to make it say what you want it to say it now leads to what takes place in the fourth trumpet fourth trumpet Angel sounded. A third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars. We know a little bit already because we've covered some of this even tonight, what the sun and stars are all about. So that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. That's it. That's your whole fourth, fourth trumpet. Again, we're looking at the sun, moon, stars, a third being darkened, not shining, not bringing light. Well, what, is it, what does the sun represent? Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path, right? Um, often, the sun is a reference to the word of God. And um, if 
you have a distortion in this third trumpet. We're going to be seeing an intensification here in this fourth trumpet. You begin to see an obscuring of the word of God where they are taking and bringing darkness in. Um, Joel puts it this way. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun, the moon will grow dark. The stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. The background to this trumpet would really be day four of creation where you have the uh, sun, moon, and stars, but it's also the ninth plague of Egypt, the plague of darkness. Because again, we have a reminder that God gives light, that it is God who leads us in his way everlasting, and that if there is an, obscu if there is an unfaithfulness in it, then there's going to be an obscuring of the word. What's happened is that leading up to this, you had a lot of false teachings coming into the church. A lot of distortions of who God is and, 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 and what God wants to do to people and how God's going to uh, torture people and all of these different things that would come in about God and twisting up the character of who our God is. Here it leads really to an atheistic picture of, well, I don't want to believe in that God. I don't want to believe in a God. And so you begin to see a darkening where they would distort in the, in the beginning. Now they would lead to an obscuring where they would totally wipe it out. In Egypt, the atheistic comment from the pagan king of Egypt, Pharaoh, as God told Moses to go to him and tell him to let my people go, Pharaoh replies, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. You're talking here about a very pompous statement here. Who is God that I should listen to him? I am Pharaoh. I am the greatest king of the earth. Uh, next to me, there is no one. I am number one. Who are you going to talk to me about are the gods? People worship me. And he began to buy into his own, thinking he was all of that. But he was no god. He was a mortal man. He was sitting on the throne, and he had been created. He was not the creator. God himself had spoken and said, let my people go. Therefore, who can get in the way? Pharaoh was about to find out. But here in this very statement, we begin to get a picture of what is going on in the world today. Many people say, you don't have to believe in a God. You are your own God. You have God within you. You have powers if you just learn how to use them, and so on and so forth. And they have completely gone backwards to where this pagan guy, uh, uh, king had to learn about who the true God really was. Deuteronomy, and looking at the blessings, looking at the curses. Here in this verse, we're looking at the curses. This is uh, upon those who would not be faithful. This is upon those who would reject the word of God. And he says, you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in the darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plundered continually and no one shall save you. One of the curses of disobeying God would be darkness or blindness, that this would come upon them and they would not be able to see. Throughout the scriptures, you begin to get this sense that they're going to be searching, they're going to be looking, they're going to be longing. They want to hear the word of God, but they cannot find it. There's a famine for the word of God. We looked at that the other night. 
here you see that the darkness that comes as a curse to those who refuse to obey God, who refuse to walk in his ways, and they are oppressed. You see, in this trumpet, there's an absence of the truth. Oh, I know in the past one we looked at it and it was a distortion of the truth, but that distortion always leads to an absence. Now, when we twist God's word up and sometimes we think we're making it better, but we're not. If you take and change the word that God has given, it now becomes of none effect. You see, the eclipse of truth is a reference here to an absence of the truth. Third trumpet, we saw a false religion, a distortion of the true. Uh, Satan leading people to follow after something other than the true word of God. But the fourth one, by the time we get here, we're saying there is no God. By the time we get to this one, we're, we're, they're not even seeing the truth. They're not even seeing the word. They could still see it in the third one. They were just twisting it up, and that always leads. In fact, um, apostasy in the church actually encourages or invites secularism and atheism. Because when we distort the picture of who God is, it now brings people to the point where they don't believe in a God. I have sat in prophecy seminars where I've heard people make these prophecies, make these predictions, setting these dates that did not happen. And when it goes on time after time, how many people are going to continue to believe in the Word of God? Because if what I'm saying the Word of God says doesn't come to pass, then that makes it sound like the Word of God is wrong. No, that person was wrong. Stay true to the Word of God. And while there is an obscuring of the word throughout these dark ages leading up into the part where they, they took the Bibles away from the people and they were, there was an obscuring of it, God always had his faithful remnant. People who would obey him, people who would follow him and continue to maintain the truths of his word. Fourth trumpet, what was it really all about? Well, when the church falls away from the truth, doesn't shine as it should, it makes atheism all the more attractive. Fourth trumpet, it's the opposite of creation. God created, he said, let there be light in a world that was just nothing but darkness. And now, in, the, in this trumpet, we see an obscuring of that light. A taking away of the light, bringing darkness back in. Because if a person is going to choose to follow after a distorted version or teaching of the Bible, God says he's going to give them up to believe in their fables. He's going to give them up and let them continue in their ways. What we have in the fourth trumpet is an intensification of the third. That while there was a distortion of the word of God, now there is an obscuring of the word of God. This is going to really lead us into what's taking place in these next trumpets. It is preparing us for what's going to happen here in the end times. Because what we're seeing here that took place uh, here at the, uh, uh, right after and during the time of the dark ages, we're going to see replayed again in Revelation 18 in a more deep and meaningful way here in our world today, coming up soon. What we're going to see is the light and darkness and the battle that takes place. What we're going to see in these chapters coming up is God's victorious battle as he leads his people through and helps them to be faithful and leads them to overcome so that they can sit with him on his throne even as he overcame and sat with his father. Throughout the Old Testament, darkness was used as a punishment. But throughout the scriptures, light 
is what leads to Jesus. He is the light of the world. You are the light. When you reflect the light that Jesus has given you, when you have the word of God filling your life, you're able to share it with the world living in darkness where they don't know the truth, where they don't know the word of God. God now calls you forth to share and let them know. You see, Revelation is a revealing. It lets us see Jesus. And in the midst of all of this stuff that's taking place, there is a call for grace. There's a call for repentance. There's a, uh, a Savior waiting to lead and to heal. Right here is the verse that I was telling you that I spent so much time on. Right here, chapter 8, verse 13. I thought all this would be a safe text. There's not going to be much on this one. Man, was I mistaken. This text is so filled with so much. And right off the bat, he says, I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice. Again, before we go on, I want you to catch a couple of things. We'll go into a little more tomorrow night. I heard an angel. It says in the King James, this is the New King James, uses the same word. You won't find that anywhere else. Every other version says eagle. Every Greek manuscript I could find says eagle or vulture. Angel is used here in the King James only. And so part of my assignment was to figure out why did they use the word angel here in this verse. You know what I found out? I didn't. I speculated. The best I can figure out is they had Revelation 14 in mind where he said, I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven. The word in the Greek was very similar between angel and, and eagle. And I don't know, did they miss? You know, every manuscript seems to say eagle. When you see this in context, uh, it's the eagle that will make sense. We're not going to make a big deal about that part of it. But what I do want you to see is flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to whom? Who are the inhabitants of the earth? Those who are not in Christ. You will see that in chapter 9, verse 4. You will see that throughout Revelation. Those that dwell upon the earth are the wicked. Those who dwell in heaven are the righteous. Our home is in heaven. And so this is where I first began to learn that expression. I studied that out. The inhabitants of the earth or those who dwell upon the earth is the exact same expression in the Greek. English, we can change it all up. So we got all these words. But it was the same expression. Every place it was used, it was referring to the wicked. So these woes on the next three trumpets are upon the wicked. While we had the judgment beginning at the house of God in trumpet one, we now begin to see that these woes are falling upon those who reject the gospel commission, who reject this call that goes out. Uh, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet which the three angels are about to sound. Tomorrow night, we're going to be looking at those trumpets. Trumpet five, trumpet six, and then there's this long interlude, and you have trumpet seven. Just like you had the four horsemen in the seven seals, and then you had the two there, you know, five and six. They seem to be separated. A long interlude, and then you had the seventh uh, seal, silence in heaven for half an hour. You have the exact same format here with the trumpets. And uh, tomorrow night we're going to go into it. You're going to see uh, the power of God to deliver through the most trying circumstances we serve a mighty God powerful God a God who knows the end from the beginning a God who is here to deliver his people these prayers of the saints going up the incense that is thrown back down here to the earth the prayers of the saints we begin to see this is God answering the call bringing justice to this world bringing an end to all the sin, the sorrow, the suffering, and God who wants to deliver his people is, has this in his hands. He is in control, and we're going to see the end result is so much better 
than all that we could face today. You looking forward to the end? Looking forward to when Jesus comes back? Looking forward to being with your God again? Do you want to just say in your own hearts? You don't have to raise your hand or, or shout out loud. But do you want to just say with me, God, thank you for being in control. That you are a God I can trust. And through all of this, I know you're going to lead us home. Father in heaven, thank you for the promise that you'll always be faithful. Thank you for showing us the results of being faithful and, 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 and unfaithful. Lord, I pray that you will help us listening today to make a commitment that we will be faithful. That we will let Jesus live in our lives and that we will live for you. Father, we thank you again. We pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as you have promised and lead us into all of your truth. That we will not just say, this is what I've always done, but that we will look to the truth as it is in Jesus. Thank you, Father, in your name. Amen. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, we're going to be looking at the next three trumpets, trumpets 5, 6, and 7 from Revelation chapter 9. And right now, you see Tim going back to get the basket, so make sure you have your cards. And if you, don't, if you didn't receive a card, make sure you uh, let him know so he can get...